So I'm excited about class two and my intro to psychology journey. Open Yale courses. Please check out that link in the description is right at the top. I want you to jump into follow along with me and get all this information. But I'm excited because today's class is about foundations of the brain. And I love this topic. So let's jump right on in. The concept of dualism is an idea that you find at the heart of most religious and spiritual paths. And it was heavily um, a part of the work of Plato. And that is something that's not unfamiliar to people, but maybe by name. Dualism is the idea that many people believe in, that we are more than just uh, material beings, that we have a soul or a spirit and that kind of thing. I remember when I first um, encountered this, at least the term, I believed um, in dualism before, I no longer do. Um, but I remember when I first encountered the term and realized that it was called dualism. So one of the people that was known for speaking a lot about uh, dualism was Rene Descartes. And he asked the questions, uh, are humans merely um, material beings? And he came up you know, with his ideas. He even thought that animals were machines actually, more like robots. And we'll talk more about Descartes in the end. I think the idea of dualism is the biggest seller because I think it's the most attractive for most people. I mean, many of us are merely afraid, like truthfully, and even, I guess you could say not even merely, but like understandably and justifiably afraid of what will happen after we die or is this it, you know? And so as I've studied religion and spirituality over the years, that's where I realized the ideas came from. Humankind, we just have trouble not knowing things and not having an answer for things. We're afraid a lot of times to say, I don't know. And then also many of us are afraid of what's after death and that kind of thing. As I was going through my process, I got to the point where I was like, how afraid was I before I got here? So there's no reason to be afraid about anything after that. Um, but I realized why it's the biggest um, held belief in you know, are the majority of us as a species because I just quite frankly think it's more comforting. I don't think that we have uh, the evidence at all to prove that we have souls and that kind of thing. But um, I think it's the most comforting though. And I think that most people dread the idea of there not being anything after this or what is after this. And like I said, I don't have that fear anymore. Um, and I don't hold the what I feel is unjustified belief um, of afterlife and that kind of thing. But I do understand why it provokes many people because um, it's quite comforting, you know, and I can understand that. Right after talking about Descartes, the teacher went into a next uh, section that is so reminiscent of things I talk about regularly. I think that a lot of our thought process comes from the fact that we have the ability to imagine. And that's an advanced trait. You know, one of the early things that he talked about in this discussion is that Descartes realized that unlike machines, we had the ability to not just say be okay, but we could state how we wanted to feel. We could imagine um, certain states or imagine certain scenarios or ideas. And that's something I talk about a lot because I think a lot of our beliefs, um, many of our religious and spiritual beliefs, I really believe come down to the ability for us to imagine. And I've often said, and especially because I've always been someone where math was like one of my number one subjects, I realized that our brains had the ability to put together a mathematical, like, or to put together a scenario, like mathematically, and it'd be real here, even if it's not real in reality. And so the teacher talked about how, like, you know, there was a book where a person invited you, well, the person said that they, they woke up in the body of an insect, you know, and, and then they go through the, the you know, the uh, story and is inviting the listener and the reader into what that would be like. And because everybody has the ability to do that, even though that's not a real thing that we experience, it gives us this enhanced ability. I think that it's, you know, everything has its pros and its cons. So that's a huge pro. It allows us to build skyscrapers and fly to the moon, you know. Um, but it also has the con, uh, everything has cons. So it also has, uh, gives us the possibility of creating things or imagining things and believing in things that aren't quite real 
even though we have the ability to make them real here and reinforce them through you know looking for different patterns here i was talking about it yesterday on the live stream we are pattern seeking uh, individuals that's how we survive that's evolution you survive because you recognize very nuanced patterns which allows you to save your life or notice real small subtle things to protect yourself um, but on the flip side, what that does is if I had like, a, I think it's the Geico commercial uh, where they have the little money stack with the two eyes on top. When we look at that, even though that's just two fake eyes sitting on top of, you know, some dollar bills, our brain puts together the connection of a face and we see a face, even though it's not really a face, it's a couple objects. Another way that I've um, even done this, like as a, a little bit of a... Uh, what do I want to call it, test or something like that, um, is to like draw a smiley face on a piece of paper and I'll look at it and then I'll turn it upside down and try to look at it from the perspective that I'm just looking at shapes, not a real face. And I find that I have a hard time doing that because our brains, when it comes to facial recognition and patterns, seeks for that really, really strongly. So yeah, I think it's significant that the teacher is currently talking about the imagination and what it has to do with um, these different beliefs that we come up with. The mind reflects the workings of the brain, just like computation reflects the workings of the computer. That's the way that uh, it was just put by Paul Bloom, the teacher in this course. And I thought that was a really eloquent way of putting it. Many people have many different thoughts about the, the concept of the mind and the brain and and that kind of thing. But what he was saying is that the scientific consensus is that dualism is in fact not correct. That there is not a separation between you and your mind or your brain and your mind or two of you or you and then an afterlife version of you and that kind of thing. And like I said, this is something that I've been thinking about for a while. I mean, I respect different people's views and their beliefs especially as it pertains to their optimism in life and their hope. Um, but it's just, you know, something uh, to really think about and something that I thought about for a while. And I know that for many people, myself included, like I guess about 10 years ago, to swallow or accept that fact somehow meant that life was ultimately meaningless or that life was like, oh gosh, it's, it's, there's no purpose. Like, why am I here? Like, this is just random. It's my mistake and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I realized that I've come to the conclusion where I think that's just immaturity, actually. And I don't say that to be offensive. I say that because I used to feel that way. And I realized it was because I was afraid of certain things and I had to have answers for certain things. Um, but now I'm able to accept things like, you know, the consensus on things and the information um, that we have and the evidence that we have. And the best thing I can say is that for things where we don't have good information or we have certain uh, ideas and hypotheses, but they aren't necessarily backed up by evidence at this point, the best thing is to say, I don't know. And that's something I realize many of us have a tough time saying. And so we'll accept something that's kind of ridiculous or contrary, I mean, uh, contradictory or just downright insane in the place of not knowing because it's more comforting um, to have an idea, even if it doesn't quite add up or make sense than it is to not know or not have an idea to put in that place. Um, not for everybody, but I realize though this to me feels like the majority, which leads us to, you know, the ideas that are more comforting to us. The main thing that's the cause of us having such a complex brain and being able to do things like recognize patterns um, in a very nuanced way, as well as imagine and come up with really complex uh, theories and hypotheticals is the smallest unit of the brain, which is the neuron. There's over 100 billion in your brain. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about what those are and how they break down into the three parts and why they're responsible for what they're responsible for. Now I see this is why I've always been so infatuated with like neuroscience and these kind of things. 
One interesting thing about neurons is that they are all or nothing. They either fire or they don't. There's no in-between. And the teacher was saying, you know, it's really interesting because we have a range of experience when it comes to, like he used if someone was pushing your hand. He said, based on the, the degree of the movement, it would determine whether it's pushing or not. And that's a gradient. So he said, it's really interesting, but neurons encode information in two ways. And that's in the frequency of how often they fire and how many of them fire at once. So there's a funny little paradoxical thing with alcohol. Alcohol inhibits the inhibitory parts of your brain. So the parts of your brain that keep you from, you know, doing crazy things like uh, like the teacher was saying, like, like just take your pants off out of nowhere or hit someone or just do something wild. Your brain, those parts of your brain and those neurotransmitters are relaxed. So it relaxes the relaxed part of your brain. And then of course, too much of it and then it relaxes the excite I think he said the exciting parts of your brain or the parts of your brain the neurons that's related to um, the excitement amphetamines increase the amounts of arousal by increasing uh, what's responsible for arousal in our brain which are the neurotransmitters known as neuropronephrines this is something I actually learned about recently so we'll revisit this too Prozac increases serotonin, which uh, may be responsible for its effect to help us to relieve depression. Parkinson's disease uh, lowers your dopamine, and so there's a drug called L-dopa that increases your dopamine. These are some interesting facts that science has found that we don't need a brain for. This is really interesting. We don't need a brain for vomiting. It's a natural reflex. We don't need a brain for uh, withdrawing a limb, um, you know, if feeling pain or feeling a sensation. We don't need a brain for erection. Now that one, that's going to be a whole other conversation because I never knew that. That's, that's something to talk about right there. <laughs> um, and interestingly, we don't need a brain for newborn suckling. Your medulla is responsible for heart rate and respiration. The cerebellum, which contains approximately 30 billion neurons, is responsible for body balance and muscular coordination. It took me way too long to say that. I had to do that like three times in a row. <laughs> Feeding, hunger, thirst, and sleep. That's what the hypothalamus is responsible for. So one of the most amazing findings uh, via science of the brain was when we found out that we had on our lobes, our uh, brain lobes, we had these different like topical maps that are on each of the lobes and those maps map to certain aspects of our body. And so on these lobes, there are small sections and within them, I would say probably milli, uh, millimeters apart, <laughs> they relate to maps on our body. And I've often referred to this kind of like a security guard within a building in like a control room looking at an entire campus or an entire building that maybe even has multiple floors. And so you got this big, vast building, um, but this person has like a version of that building right in their room where they're able to monitor all aspects of this large building from a small space. Um, to me, that reminds me of these topical maps on our lobes. Agnosia is a brain state where your eyes are working perfectly well where you can see but for some reason you can't recognize objects even though you're looking right at them. So you see what they are, but your brain doesn't compute and tell you what they are. It's really weird. They even call that psychic blindness. And then prosopagnosia is when you lose the ability to recognize faces. Interesting. Aphasia, aphasia, aphasia <laughs> is a disorder of language where you lose the ability to speak. And they said it was a classic case in 1861, Paul Broca, who had a certain uh, damage to his brain where he could only say one word, which was tan, T-A-N, tan, over and over. That's all he could say because of the type of damage to his brain. So they were talking about how interesting it is when we study these cases, when neuroscientists have studied, and it's what has allowed us to learn all that we learn now about our brains. Receptive aphasia is when a person can speak very fluently, but the words that they say don't make any sense. 
acquired psychopathy is damage to the frontal lobes of your brain where you can't tell the difference between right and wrong. People who are right-handed have language in their left hemisphere of their brain, and people who are left-handed can have language in either hemisphere of the brain. So for right-handed people, language is on the left, and math and music is on the right, interestingly. I've been really digging in hard on the right side of the brain um, from the perspective of like your left brain being real analytical, at least so I thought, and the right side of the brain coming from that place of creativity, you know, and that's what I learned. Um, and from what I would consider like a heart space, just kind of like in the moment, improvisation, creativity. I've been there for a while as I've been studying jazz and even applying that kind of right brain, you know, from your heart, from your gut, creativity, feeling, going with the flow thing. To, I've been applying that to life for a while. So I'm interested to see where we go with this because, um, yeah, math and music are both subjects that I'm good at. And to learn that because I'm right-handed, that's on the right hemisphere of my brain is really fascinating. So one of the good things about science and psychology is honesty. <laughs> and so uh, right now, the scientific consensus is that we can't come to a full conclusion of how is it that this gray matter and this mushy thing that we have called a brain can give rise to so many uh, things that we experience, like emotions and the ability to make high complex decisions and these kind of things. We know a whole lot, but we also know that there's a whole lot to learn. And I particularly, as a secular humanist, really appreciate this because I think that some like religious and spiritual um, hypotheses are kind of dishonest and take big leaps in many ways. And so um, I like how he ended the class where he was like, you know, we're going to end on a bit of humility uh, to say that although different people come to different conclusions and some people think that they have figured out the answers to why we do what we do, even if it comes down to their holy books and that kind of thing, um, that the scientific community is pretty honest about it, that this is what we know and this is how much we have to go. So I really appreciate that. So a little bit more info on Rene Descartes. Descartes has been heralded as the first modern philosopher. He was famous for having made an important connection between geometry and algebra, which allowed for the solving of geometrical problems by way of algebraic equations. He's also famous for having promoted a new conception of matter, which allowed for the accounting of physical phenomena by way of mechanical explanation. However, he is most famous for having written a relatively short work, Med meditations <laughs> the prima philosophia uh, meditations on first philosophy couldn't pronounce any of that <laughs> published in 1641 in which he provides a philosophical groundwork for the possibilities of the sciences what is Descartes theory Descartes dualism of mind and matter implied a concept of human beings um, he was also a rationalist and believed in the power of innate ideas. Descartes argued the theory of innate knowledge that all humans were born with knowledge through the higher power of a God. And I think that might be it. That's a little bit about Descartes. He was born March 31st, 1956 in uh, France and he died February 11th, 1650 in Stockholm, Sweden. His education, University of Poitiers, 1614 to 1616. Um, yeah, I like this quote from him. It is not enough to have a good mind. The main thing is to use it well. The greatest minds are capable of the greatest vices as well as the greatest virtues. Divide each difficulty into as many parts as feasible and necessary to resolve it like that. I'm a quotes guy, so I, I can appreciate those. A quick definition of neurons, a specialized cell transmitting nerve impulses, a nerve cell. And people ask, what is a neuron and what does it do? The neuron is the basic working unit of the brain, a specialized cell designed to transmit information to other nerve cells, muscle or gland cells. Neurons are cells within the nervous system and transmit information to other nerve cells, and they were saying chemically, muscle or gland cells. Most neurons have a cell body 
and axon and dendrites. Those were the three parts. Um, what are the three types of neurons? The three major types of neurons are sensory neurons, motor neurons, and interneurons. All three have different functions, but the brain needs all of them to communicate effectively with the rest of the body and vice versa. Um, so the three main parts of those is that neurons have three parts that carry out the functions of communication and integration, dendrites, axons, and axon terminals. They have a fourth part called the cell body or soma, which carries out the basic life processes of neurons. The figure, oh, that's something relating to, yeah. So that is a little bit on neurons. And this is what makes them special. The dendrites receive signals at the axons and the axons transmit that signal to the next neurons dendrites. This allows for a unidirectional cell signaling between neurons. Neurons are excitable because they can be themselves stimulated. Yeah, how many brain cells die in a day? Just a couple more little fun facts. Every second, 32,000 neurons or brain cells die. That's 1.9 million in a minute. God damn, I need to be double time in my learning so I can feed them all back in. In that same minute, your brain loses 14 billion synapses. The vital intersections between those neurons, that was one of the things they mentioned there. Um, that's the connection between and information shoots through a gap. And why are neurons so important? Neurons are specialized to transmit information through the body. These highly specialized nerve cells are responsible for communicating information in both chemical and electrical forms. Sensory neurons carry information from the sensory receptors through the body to the brain. How can you boost these brain cells? Fatty fish, <laughs> blueberries, turmeric, broccoli, pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, and nuts. And it's interesting because they say coffee, um, <laughs> coffee as well can do it. And then last but not least, psychopharmacology, which is the scientific study of the effects drugs have on mood, sensation, thinking, and behavior. It is distinguished from neuropsychopharmacology, say that three times fast, which emphasizes the correlation between drug-induced changes in the functioning of cells in the nervous system and changes in consciousness and behavior. What does a psychopharmacologist do? They use their extensive knowledge of the nervous system, mental disorders, dosage, drug side effects, drug interactions, and how drugs affect the body systems to develop a treatment plan. They can also work as researchers or for drug companies testing and developing medicine. And that's it. So this completes uh, this video. Oh my gosh, I'm having so much fun on this journey. I feel my, I feel my neurons increasing. So I'm I'm replenishing some of those uh, 1.9 million. That's oh my gosh, I feel my brain dying as we talk. No, it's like, so I'm enjoying this journey. I hope that you are too. Uh, jumping into the next class, round three. Let me tell you what that is. Hold on one second. And I'm back. So the next class is uh, class three, which is talking about Freud. And I'm really interested in jumping into that because from what I was listening to before, I was quite surprised to find out that Freud was an asshole.